I'm back, kind of, sort of, not really, but I'm, I'm here. I still have COVID, um, and that that sucks. Happy New Year's Eve, by the way, but uh, the show is pretty much going to be done for me today because I have Tyler Ford and Zach going and so many locked on NFL hosts coming on, and we're going to get into it today only here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. And just so you know. Today's episode of Locked On Gators is brought to you by NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. Head to netsuite.com slash NCAA for special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. Today's the last day, by the way, for end-of-year financing, so that's fun. Of course, today's episode is going to be a little bit different. It's Friday. Happy Friday. Happy New Year's Eve. I'm going to be joined by quite a few guests taken over the whole show pretty much few gators fans few nfl hosts that are going to be going through it we're going to get into it right now and sorry i'm gonna let you know i realize i just did the right now thing but this is gonna be the last time you see me until the ad reads that are pre-recorded and then the outro which will be recorded right now also so happy new year and hopefully monday we'll be back to normal scheduling Hey, I'm Zach Cohen of the Draft Network, helping Brandon out today ahead of New Year's by telling you what I'd like to see from the Gators in 2022. First off, obviously, here's hoping that Brandon and anyone who's sick feels better. That's clearly atop my 2022 wish list. Next up, though, I have some wishes for Gators football and men's basketball, both of which are drastically different and what more is there really to ask for in other departments like gators baseball softball tennis gymnastics they may not be perfect but they more or less they satisfy us every year gators football though oh man it's been a rough year (laughs) it has been a rough and you don't need me to tell you that luckily billy napier is the new guy in charge and with it a new hope for a brighter future it's nice isn't it but i think the real question doesn't come down to what are my expectations for the team but rather what should they be i talked about this in an article for the draft network a month or so ago and it really comes down to should we expect uf to win the sec east next season let alone win the whole thing no we shouldn't especially with georgia dominating the way they are We shouldn't expect Napier to just come in and blow the roof off of college football. What we should expect, what I'd at least like to see, is tangible progress. That starts with the clear establishment of a culture, something which the football program has been lacking for quite some time. Over the last two years alone, there have been rampant reports of Dan Mullen losing his locker room. Will there be a player or two who seemingly fall out of line? Of course. Napier's first season won't be perfect. We shouldn't expect it to be. I would just love to see the players clearly buying in. I think that will become obvious as the season moves along what that exactly entails. Now, in terms of the win-loss column, obviously, I'd love to see him win the championship, go undefeated, yada, yada, yada. I think a four-loss season at minimum seems fine. Three losses my exception, is my expectation, I would say. Admittedly, though, I do send a te- I choose tend to set low expectations. And the last thing I'd like to see from the Gators, before we have a much-needed chat about men's basketball, the Gators need Anthony Richardson to be the guy. He has to be. Now, I'm not setting the bar at Heisman levels or anything, but he needs to show he's comfortable in a new offense, which is reasonable. There's no denying AR's obvious talent. The Gators just can't afford to whiff on another highly touted quarterback recruit, let alone any highly touted recruit. And that's especially with this army of a coaching staff and player development staff and everything else going into it that Napier has clearly put together. I mean, the hype is warranted with what Napier has done in his short tenure thus far with the Gators. So I think both both of those wishes are attainable and they would be pretty good signs for the future of Florida football. Now, oh man, men's basketball 
On the other hand, where to begin? I can honestly sum up my wish list for Gators men's basketball in three words. Fire Mike White. Is that harsh? Ah, that, maybe that sounds a bit too harsh. I don't know. But look, White just isn't getting the job done. He isn't. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Something has to change. The Gators offense is textbook insanity. You'd assume there are hidden complexities we don't see from the offense because it's a power five basketball team, right? So why does it just look like Mike White tells his team to just stay along the perimeter, hope to create separation, chuck up a three-pointer? I mean, seriously, watch possession. It will always seem like everyone on any possession, but whoever's playing center, is just standing around the three-point line, waiting to see if they get the ball. And if they do, no one really makes any cuts or moves to help the ball handler out. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but it's still frustrating that that is the general image of Mike White basketball in Florida, at least on the offense side of the ball. And it's an offense that really only works if shots are falling because they don't do enough to create shots. They just kind of stand there hoping that they'll have enough separation to chuck one in. Of course, it's a very baseline way of explaining it. I'm sure there's a lot of more uh, intricacies that go into the offense because, again, we have to give Mike White the benefit of the doubt. But that's just what it looks like as a casual fan, as someone who covers the team. It's, it's easy to see that. I'd like to see Florida rely more on plays and scheming players open and ball movement. Extra emphasis on the ball movement. Now, again, to White's credit, his players and staff seem to really like him. He's a sorcerer with the transfer portal. He's touted as a good recruiter, for whatever that's worth. But clearly, it's not working out. You cannot lose to a 1-7 Texas Southern team by 15 at home and expect to make a run in the tournament. Not only was that the worst loss I've ever seen for Gators men's basketball, it was a terrible birthday present. I was there hoping they'd get the W, and they just fell flat on their face at a historic rate. There is just way too much talent on this Gators roster to waste it on someone who has clearly plateaued. So those are the big things I'd love to see from Florida Athletics. If you liked what I had to say, thanks. Feel free to follow me on all social platforms. Zach Cohen FB, Z-A-C-H-C-O-H-E-N-F-B. You can also follow my show, The Breakout Football Podcast, on all platforms. And if you didn't like what I had to say... Go tell Brandon, he'll deal with it. He'll get it right. And I hope everyone, of course, has a safe and happy new year. This is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls right over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your business's growth. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and right now through the end of the year, which is less than two weeks away, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those who are ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash NCA. Head to netsuite.com slash NCA for special end-of-year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. That is netsuite.com slash NCAA. Welcome back to Locked On Gators. I am Tyler Fornest. You can find me on Twitter at The Real Forno. And Brandon, I appreciate you asking me to come on today because, man, this Gators team has really taken us on a ride. After last year, where it just felt like everything was starting to fall into place, Dan Mullen had this team rocking and rolling on the offensive side of the football. There was the loss to Texas a which was a little bit frustrating, but once Marco Wilson threw that shoe, it really felt like the wheels started to come off. And they, they got destroyed in the bowl game, and then you started to see little tidbits, little things uh, from Dan Mullen. The press conference, he was not exactly very positive, very good in that press conference. He was, he kind of talked down about the players. And yeah, as a fan and analyst, I kind of blew that off a little bit because it was a frustrating game and there was a lot of things that you could have 
that you could say about it, but it seemed to me like an isolated incident. And then as we move forward into the 2021 season, it, you could tell that it wasn't. He just he lost the team. He Whatever passion he had for the Florida Gators program seemed to really dissipate. And it all seemed to start uh, at that Kentucky game. They could not move the ball at all. There was a refusal to play Anthony Richardson, whether that be because of the knee injury or because of just Mullen's stubbornness with Emory Jones being the first quarterback he recruited. He went to the University of Florida when he came back as the head coach, and it all spiraled out of control. And now uh, we bring in Billy Napier. And Napier, early on, has seemed like the guy to really be the renaissance for this program. And it's very interesting because we thought Mullen was going to be the same. McIlwain showed flashes early on, and then Muschamp was taking over for Urban Meyer, and he was the guy in waiting at Texas for quite some time before he ended up taking the Florida job. So when you look at all those things, I'm going to be kind of distant a little bit from the Napier stuff, but being able to flip five-star safety Kamari Wilson right away being able to get the four-star linebacker, I believe, uh, Shamari Johnson. I may be misremembering his name. But being able to score those two guys in the early signing period after only having been on the job for a couple weeks, with Wilson not even really being on the radar uh, for the Gators at the time, this is a really good positive sign. He wants to build a huge staff that focuses heavily in recruiting. Napier knows how to recruit the hell out, out of things. And it looks really good. Um now, when you kind of take a look at the uh, team he's inheriting, we did lose Jacob Copeland to Maryland, which is very frustrating. Copeland was one of my favorite Gators, and you could just tell that he was underutilized during his entire tenure in Gainesville. He just had so much more to offer, especially as a deep threat, and I hope that he is able to take his talents to Andover and really take that next step. Now, as far as uh, everybody else on the offensive side of the ball, Who's going to take over for Malik Davis and Damian Pierce? Uh, is it going to be Lorenzo Lingard? Is it going to be Demarcus Bowman? Like, these are two guys that are fantastic running backs. Plus, you have Naquan Wright as well, who I was very high on coming into the season, especially as a pass catcher from the backfield. I'm not sure how they're going to kind of go about this, but I do know that Billy Napier at the University of Louisiana loved to use two backs. Just in 2020, Elijah Mitchell and Trey Regis, they both ran for over 1,000 yards. And this past season, Chris Smith and uh, Montrell Johnson did a fantastic job running out of the backfield as well. They have no problem rotating guys in and out to make sure that one, they stay fresh, and two, they do a fantastic job of just chipping away at the run game. Now, Anthony Richardson, it projects out to be the starter with Emory Jones having hit the transfer portal. We don't know for sure if Jones is leaving yet. Let's wait for a commitment before we really hand the, we can feel comfortable handing the keys over as fans. Because if Jones ends up coming back, then as frustrating as it is, we're going to have ourselves a quarterback competition. And Richardson may not be the guy, per se, until we know for sure what happens with Jones. In all, all honesty, Richardson should have been the guy in the Alabama game if he didn't uh, get hurt right before that against South Florida. You could just tell that Jones had something, or sorry, that Richardson had something Jones didn't, and that was just that extra element. It, it was something that this team hadn't seen at the quarterback position since Tim Tebow was on campus. There was just something special about Richardson. He was dynamic. He had a cannon. He was able to uh, run and pass both successfully. And... For whatever reason, Jones remained the starter of this team. And obviously, Richardson started at the Georgia game. It did not really go that well. But it's really hard to put all that blame on Richardson because the team was kind of in a downward spiral. And that Georgia defense is the best we've seen since 2011 Alabama. The best defense in a decade in college football is going to be hard to score on. Even with Alabama putting up 41 points in the SEC championship game, that Georgia defense is still allowing less than 10 points per game. On the defensive side of the football, you are losing a couple guys. Zach Carter, Jeremiah Moon, uh, Mohamed Dubate is, just entered the transfer portal, so you can uh, expect him to be gone as well. Uh, Kyer Elam, it would be a surprise if he comes back to campus, considering he could be a top 10, top 15 selection in the NFL draft. 
But the, this defense is really going to be built around a couple guys moving forward. Um, Brenton Cox is coming back for his senior season. That's going to be a huge boost to that pass rush and defensive line. Going into the season, there was some talk that Cox could elevate himself into a first-round pick. He didn't end up doing that this year. He had a good season, but there's still a little bit left to be desired as far as wanting something from the next level. Um, two guys that I am very, very excited about. Cornerback Jason Marshall. Uh, he had some struggles early on this year, but he was also a true freshman. And you could tell as the season went on and on, he was getting more and more comfortable. And I thought he had a fantastic bowl game against Central Florida. And then my favorite signing of the 2021 class, safety Corey Collier, did not really play at all this season. But he is a hard hitter. He has range. And he has great instincts. And I think that the, he's going to be able to take that next step for the Florida Gators and become that next great safety on the back end. Guys like Major Wright. Marcus May, Marquan Manuel. I think Corey Collier has the talent to be that next guy for the Florida Gators. As far as what 2022 should look like, it's going to be a lot tougher in the SEC East. Hendon Hooker is back for Tennessee, and that offense seems to be clicking. Spencer Rattler going to South Carolina is going to add another extra element. Kentucky looks like they're going to be a top 10 team going into 2022. The SEC East is not a cakewalk anymore, and let's be honest, it never really was, but it, they're going to be some games that were easily winnable that are going to be tough to win this year. The Gators really need to figure things out on offense, and I think Billy Napier is going to be able to right that ship. If Anthony Richardson can play really solid football and you get a good running game from the running backs, I think that this Florida team could be back in a New Year's Six Bowl. It's a little too far away to be talking playoff, but a couple good recruiting classes from Billy Napier, maybe we could have that turnaround like we saw with Urban Meyer. In all honesty, stay positive. I believe that Napier is going to be able to turn this Florida team around. Um, thank you guys very much for your time. You can follow me on Twitter, at the Real Forno, and go Gators. Have y'all tried Bill Bar Puffs yet? Because I've been saying, I've been talking about it for a few weeks, so if you haven't, that's just so rude of you, and I hate you. I cannot believe that you would do that to me. They are very good. Ruby chocolate is amazing. The lemon cheesecake is very good. Built Bar is the best protein bar on the market. If you're trying to eat clean, but you've got a sweet tooth like this guy right here, that is no longer a problem. Built Bar is your low-calorie, low-sugar, high-protein, most importantly, high-fiber solution that tastes amazing. You can even enjoy Built Bar if you're keto. Remember to use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off of your next order. That is LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, to get 15% off of your next order at Built or BuiltBar.com, where they're always adding flavors, so don't miss out. It's, it's just great stuff. The selection is amazing for them. Hello, it's me, Aaron Freeman of Locked On Falcons, to give you your Atlanta Falcons Florida Gators update. Obviously, Kyle Pitts is in the midst of a potentially historic rookie season for a tight end with 949 yards, surpassing the Mark Jeremy Shockey set in 2002, and is now within reach of the all-time record set by Mike Ditka in 1961 with 1,076 yards. That success has earned Pitts a Pro Bowl bid, again, the first time a rookie tight end has done that since Shockey. Pitts has mostly lived up to the hype this year. Beyond him, ex-Gator Dante Fowler has performed better in 2021 than he did a year ago in his first year in Atlanta. He has a team-leading four-and-a-half sacks. While Fowler hasn't come close to living up to the $15 million a year price tag that the Falcons paid him a year ago. He's made a few more impact plays this season, so it doesn't feel like a complete total waste of money there. The last two ex-Gators on the Falcons roster are defensive lineman Jonathan Bullard and quarterback Felipe Franks. Bullard has been a decent rotational option along the Falcons defensive line, contributing as a run defender, while Franks has been an interesting experiment for the Falcons. He's dabbled at times as a tight end, a personal protector on a punt team. He's gotten some opportunities as a wildcat quarterback in short yardage situations, and his role has been somewhat reminiscent to how the New Orleans Saints utilized Taysom Hill at the beginning of his career. It's also worth noting that in the month of December, it has been Franks that has been active on game days as Matt Ryan's backup rather than Josh Rosen, suggesting that the Falcons have seen some development from the former undrafted free agent over the course of this 2021 season. Now, as we near the end of 2022, as we near the end of 2021, I'm sorry, I'm looking forward to what plans the Falcons have for both Pitts and Franks as we get ready for 2022.
What's going on, Gators fans? Ross Jackson here, host of Locked On Saints. Former Florida Gators C.J. Gardner-Johnson is going to be remembered mostly in 2021 for being the guy that refused to back down from Tom Brady and, of course, all the big images of him mean-mugging Tom Brady uh, in the Saints shutout of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers all over social media. But he's so much more than just the attitude and the trash-talking that you know national talking head media folks tend to kind of highlight him for. He has been someone that has been invaluable for the New Orleans Saints defense. He is an emotional leader, not only for the defense, but for the team as well. He's somebody that is able to man up and match up physically with any of the bigger tight ends in his division and across the NFL. Mans up extremely well against slot receivers and even takes away options out of the backfield as well. So he has been someone that has been able to do just about anything that's asked of him over on the defensive side by the New Orleans Saints. He is an absolute invaluable piece, not only from the emotional side, not only from the getting in the heads of opponent side, but from what he can produce on the field and as a leader as well. C.J. Garner Johnson has a very bright future in New Orleans, and I expect that he'll be in New Orleans for quite a while. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. And don't miss out on Monday as we'll get to the latest on the Florida Gators football team, what we missed last week or well, this week really, but you know, you get the deal with COVID. And now make your second listen, Lockdown Bets, your daily one stop shop for all of your gambling needs. Locked on Bets, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. For Locked on Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Thank you to everyone that contributed before. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. You can find all my written work with Whole Line Sports. That is W-H-O-L-E and I-N-E Sports. And I will see you all Monday, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully. See you all next year at some point. There you go.